Welcome to the Boss It Weekly podcast. A no-nonsense, no-hype, frank, and close-up analysis of what is currently working and what is not in the world of software. The Boss It podcast is packed with major takeaways for software business owners and managers. So, let's begin. Welcome back to the Boss It podcast. So, the podcast for predominantly software entrepreneurs throughout the world. Um, a lot of what, I've, what I like to talk about is based upon my own experience of being sort of 30 years in the software sector and probably the last 22 years um, seeing the software sector through the lens of doing mergers and acquisitions. So we've done mergers and acquisitions on four continents now. And obviously that gives me quite a fortunate position. It gives me an insight to be able to really see into the depths of some software companies and get a different perspective that perhaps some of you might see. So I also like to reach out and find interesting people that have got their own story to tell, that um, sometimes it's people actually running software sector uh, business that have been in the software sector for some time. Sometimes it's people providing services to that sector um, or just have a particular perspective on business that I think that, that might be useful for you all. And today I've got Greg, who I haven't known that long, actually. We've just been talking. You've reached out to me a little while ago. But Greg, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. It's an interesting story, and I don't mind telling it. I'm Greg Demetrio. I'm the CEO of Lorraine Gregory Communications and another company called Greg's Corner Office. I've been in the marketing communication business for almost 30 years now. I'm a retired New York City detective who rebranded himself in the marketing space. Uh, that was a, quite a while ago, but it was an interesting ride nonetheless. Gave me a lot of different tools because I developed really good ears. As a detective, you have to you know, separate the wheat from the chaff. So when you're talking to prospects and clients, you really get to know what they really want besides the works they're giving you. So that's given me a really big boost. So we started out in 1992 in a small little shop in Bethpage, New York, that had three little old ladies in the back room stuffing envelopes and one driver, and that was it. We had no fax machine, no computer. So fast forward to 30 years later, we're a full integrated marketing company. We have 30 employees. We have 25,000 square feet. We have the agency in the front of the house and the print and mail factory in the back of the house. And we've just recently added two television and film studios, one of which is a 3,500 3, square foot uh, studio space. Uh, so we take you through the journey of marketing and advertising wherever you need to be. Our company is the most total that we know of, and that was done on purpose so that we don't lose control of your work. All of skill sets, all the professional skills are here in-house, and we almost never send anything out. So we've created a company that can address. You can come to us with whatever your problem is in the marketing advertising space, and we can put a program together that we can control in-house. Great work. Great advert, Greg. Good start. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you that one opening, and you were yeah. in, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just started in this company yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us, I, I, I must admit, when you first approached me, the, the, the bit that caught my eye was your time with the New York Police Force. Um, because all I ever see is sort of TV programs about that. Tell us a little bit about that. How long were you in the police force? Well, you got, I was in there from, I went into the police force before my 18th birthday, actually. Wow. It was, it was a program called the trainee program where you're supposed to do clerical work, you know, filing and typing and stuff like that. Right. Except they made a mistake with me. They sent me to East Harlem to the detective squad as my very first command outside of the police academy. <laughs> and I was there with the old fedora wear and cigar smoking tattooed detectives that were world renowned. And yes. they didn't think I was supposed to be a clerical man. They thought I was supposed to be a detective to help them. So here I am, 18 years old. They put their arms around me and say, come on, kid, we'll show you how to do this job. And they taught me how to be a detective. 
The yeah. only thing I ever wanted to be after that in the, in the police department was a detective. I did a short stint in uniform patrol, which I absolutely hated because they had already converted my brain to being a detective. Yes. So it is a big divide in police departments between uniform services and detective services. So I was very, very fortunate. I had a career that uh, people would kill for. I worked undercover for about seven years. I worked semi-undercover for a while after that. And I wound up in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, which is the plum assignment for a detective anywhere in the world. And uh, it was wonderful. We worked with some really big names in the, the uh, assistant DA's uh, world. Bob Morgenthau was the DA. He actually uh, was the one who installed Rudy Giuliani into his first uh, federal commission right. where he established the RICO rules. And... You know, he, he was a kingmaker, and we were all in his orbit. Matter of fact, he was the one who got me promoted to detective. Um, he just recently passed away. Good, good man. Kingmaker, he was. But, you know, as, as luck would have it, uh, you do police work. Police work is police work. And we were doing a surveillance on an organized crime case that took us to the old Pan Am building, which is now the MetLife building, which is right behind Grand Central Station. And when we were leaving that surveillance, we ran into a uniformed police officer who was chasing somebody down Park Avenue South. And we joined the chase. I happened to be the youngest and the fastest, and I chased the guy into the building at Grand Central and turned the corner, and uh, he was ready. And he shot me before I even got through the door. And then he turned and shot the uniformed cop who was chasing him, and unfortunately, he killed him. Uh, it was a huge, huge, huge event. It was a huge event in my life. It was life changing, obviously. It changed. Yes. It, changed my, it ended my career, basically, uh, and put me on a path that I didn't know where I was going. And as luck would have it, I had a brother who was a corporate VP at Payne Weber, which is a defunct securities company. And he had brought the proxy services out from the company and started a business. And he gave me a position to run the production side. Didn't know a thing about it, right? So we had 10,000 square feet. We had no employees and no equipment. And the very next day, we had to do the proxy mail for Payne Weber. Fast forward to the following year, we had 132 employees. We had all the necessary equipment. We were probably mailing 50 million pieces of proxy mail for Payne Weber. Again, my life got turned upside down when my brother passed away very suddenly. His partners were not Wall Street people. He was the Wall Street guy with all the connections and the people that he knew. They were not. And they actually closed the business. They had the business for two and a half years, and it went from a zero business to a $5 million business overnight. Now, this is in the late 80s, so we're talking serious money. Mm. And they made a ton of money. The profit margin was huge. But they wouldn't sell it to me because they thought I'd make a success of it and they'd be cut out. So here I was again, no job, no idea what I was going to do next. I was in the middle of a, a family situation. And uh, so eventually I found this little company in the Times. If you remember way back when the Times had a tagline, it said, I found it in the Times. Well, guess what? I found it in the Times, direct mail company for sale. Ah, I know how to do that. Hmm. So I met with the owner and it was this tiny little store. He had, he had it for 25 plus years. I said, how bad can I screw this up? And I needed a job, right? So we bought this little company. Lorraine and I put what money we had together. That's why the company is called Lorraine Gregory, because she gets first billing, <laughs> the <laughs> wife, right? So we bought this little company, and we probably bill in a week what that company was billing in a year. So we've taken some ride. It's been 20-something years now, almost 30 years now. And we're in 25,000 square feet, and we have the two studios. And we're a pre we're, I call us a premier company on Long Island because we were that well-known. Mm. Uh, we we've been growing and growing and changing with the times. As a matter of fact, we just rebranded last week. Right. Uh, we took a look at ourselves and said, who are we now? We're different. We're completely different. We're working in a different business model than we had before. Uh, we cut our teeth on the low-hanging fruit, if you will, in the marketing campaigns. 
we know what we're doing now and we do it well. So we said, all right, who are we talking to? Well, we're even talking to public companies now. So we needed to change the look and the feel to match their look and feel, which is part of the rebranding process. Who are you talking to, right? So our new our brand is, is well, I'll let you know where the website is and so forth when we close out the interview. But if you go there, all of that website, all that look, the, the iconic imagery, the icons, everything are done in-house by our staff. And we're exceedingly proud of it because it, we show off. My job is to show off. Hmm. Why? Because if I can do it for me, I can do it for you. Sure. All right. So we've taken that stance for many years now. I've, I've, I talk a lot. I speak a lot. I write articles. I do all kinds of different things. And it all started out, you know, um, back in the police days, I remember my brother Bob may he rest in peace. One day he was, I was, I was bemoaning the fact that I thought I was really lucky in life. And he's laughing at me. And I go, what are you laughing at me for? He's my best friend, right? What the hell are you laughing at me for? He says, have you not yet realized that you had to be good first before you were lucky? Hmm. It was an eye-opening, life-changing comment that he hmm. made to me. It came from, came from somebody I loved dearly and I admired immensely. And when he told me that, it was like a light bulb went on. So I've not been afraid to do anything since then. That's one of the things that um, already in speaking to you and something that comes through with your story is um, the ability to change because you've been through a lot of changes. And I think that um, that is one of the important skills that I've seen in successful people and also businesses that have lasted is the ability to sometimes you've got to reinvent yourself. Um, and that requires, I think in truth, it, it requires a bit of confidence to be able to do that because we like to hang on to the habits and the things that may have worked for us in the past. Doesn't mean it's always going to work for us in the future. And you seem to have that ability. If you don't, you know, fear is a great motivator. And yes. if you approach your job with, with that fear that you could destroy it in a heartbeat, mm. it keeps you from making those disastrous mistakes. You can make mistakes and you should make mistakes because you'll never learn if you don't. Mm. But the big ones, it keeps you from doing that. So you need fear. You need courage to look over the, the uh, horizon. And you need the energy to do it. Uh, we've changed many times. And you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, not only personally. I mean, I just take that. I think the good Lord blessed me with, with abilities that I'm not even aware of that I have all of them. Right? Because sometimes I hear myself saying stuff like, oh, like, where'd you learn that? <laughs> you know? yeah. So, yeah, right? So, it, yeah, it's, it, it, I'm pretty confident about what we do. And I'm not willing to take, I'm willing to take a chance. If an yes. opportunity presents itself and I determine what the worst case scenario is and I can live with that worst case scenario, then we'll go forward. If I can't live with it, we won't. I'd like to ask you a personal question, if I may, and ignore it. We'll skip if you don't want to answer it. But being shot, I think would have, there's obviously going to be a physical damage, but also a psychological damage there. Well... What, uh, you know, how did you uh, yeah. get over, how did you get through that? Well, the physical was one thing. Yeah. I was, I was uh, home on sick leave for almost two years. Wow. Uh, the physical damage was significant. But what happened was several months later, I started to have other symptoms. Yes. And this was before PTSD was a thing. Yes. And the department had always told me, if you need to talk to somebody, we have people to talk to. And I said, no, I don't need to talk to anybody. I'm a detective. I'm a bull. I'm the guy who goes through the door first. I don't need to talk to anyone. Well, I guess what I did. Because I took three or four rides to the hospital in an ambulance thinking I was going to die any second. And what I had was, was PTSD. Yes. And, and they sent me out of that doctor's office. He told, I sat down in a chair and I didn't say a word. And he told me what was happening to me. And I said, oh, I guess you're right. And it was, it was it, yeah, to a certain extent, it was humiliating because my manhood was challenged. My detective was challenged. My being was being challenged because I was broken. But I was broken inside, not outside. I often wish I had a scar across my face so people could see it back then. Uh, but you didn't. So no. they didn't know, right? So 
the, the, the tail end of the story is I was very, very fortunate because, you know, suicides now in law enforcement is through the roof. Yes. And much of it is related to PTSD because they've been through things and seen things that they can't forget. I was never that, I never went down that rabbit hole uh, of suicide ideation, but I really understand how that could happen. You can't connect linear thought when you're in the throes of PTSD. You can't, A and B and C don't connect anymore. No. You know, you take zigzags and you, you don't, your consequences of your actions are sometimes blurred and you don't even realize it. It's a very disastrous uh, situation. I'm very devoted to the fight to uh, mitigate uh, law enforcement suicide. I'm on a couple of different boards, as a matter of fact, uh, to do that. And as soon as we get out of this COVID, we have a film uh, on the books to produce uh, in terms of PTSD. So uh, it was the, the day getting shot. I often I kid about it. I tell the story all the time. It was 11.36 in the morning on a beautiful August in, in the summertime in Manhattan, and the birds were singing, and then I got shot. Yes. You know. you, you, I, could, I could see in the circumstances of you being shooted, of being shot, that, that you have to face your own mortality because we never think, especially when we're younger, we don't think about death. But then you came very close to being killed, and you saw somebody killed as well in the same incident. We that rode, in the, same, really we rode cool. in the same ambulance. Yeah, that's going to bring you right up against that very, very quickly. And that's got to be hard. Well, what you realize that you, I realize that I've been blessed more than I ever knew. And it's not this first time. Um, I came close to dying from a heart attack. I came close to dying from COVID. I was in the hospital for 23 days. So I've been spared several times. My job now is to find out why and, yes. and, and do what I'm supposed to be doing to, to warrant that. Because I don't believe in the word deserve. You never really deserve anything. No. All, your, all your blessings come from God, and we need to do the best we can with it. We need to be good stewards of those assets that he's given us. And, and you just need to understand that the, your being on this earth is really about other people, not yourself. And that's kind of the attitude I take. I, I love my employees. Uh, I treat them like family. Um, you know, I give them the opportunities to grow, to learn. And it, hopefully they stay with us. Sometimes they won't, but sometimes they do. Mm. And, and that's, that gives me great pride because I know I know that. Yes. I start my day here. It's a big space that we're in. I start my day when I get in in the office. I'm usually here right after the shift begins. And I'll go around the whole place and say good morning to everybody. Why? Because you have to respect them. Without them, you don't have anything. Great attitude. So you've, you've obviously got resilience. You've now got um, experience as well in the area within marketing. And we were talking briefly before we started this recording um, about the changes. But first of all, talking about the importance of being able to communicate to your market. And I said one of the things that I'd seen in the software sector is companies, probably the majority of software companies, when I look at it, and to be really frank about it, that don't communicate or don't communicate effectively. What's your view about that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I created something called Greg's Corner Office so that I could talk directly to CEOs about their journey to the corner office and what that was like. So in the midst of doing that, I'm able to tell my corporate story. My personal brand is increased because now I'm talking to CEOs all over the world. So by that connection, I'm a bigger personality in my realm. And I use that platform, the Ask a CEO interview series, I use that platform to a, gain access to the C-suite so that and I can then have business conversations about marketing and advertising for Lorraine Gregory, yes. right? See what I did? I made myself the face of Greg's Corner Office. I do writing, I do blogging, I do articles in business trade magazines and, and publishing. I do, the Ask a CEO is video and podcast. So we're getting a bigger reach, right? And that's all going to inure to Lorraine Gregory Communications because marketing and advertising is now is a global undertaking. And it makes sense. It's it's a, there's a psychological reason for that because you 
you want to do business with people that you know. You want to know them because you want to trust them. You also want to know them because you want to be able to have that feeling of safety that you know how they're going to react. You know how yeah. they're going to behave in the future. Well, think about it. What was the what was the old thing in in, in, in marketing? Getting past the gatekeeper. Yes. By talking directly to CEOs, I'm getting past everybody. Exactly. So if I called you tomorrow and said, Mark, this is Greg Demetrio from Rain Gregory, you're going to pick up the phone? Of course you are. Sure. And that's that's the marketing play that comes into being after the fact. We have yes. a whole follow-up program with guests. They receive a personalized letter from me. They receive a capabilities brochure. We created a little tchotchke award type thing that we send them via UPS. So it's a, a dimensional piece that they get. Right. And we keep them in our, in our newsletters and email blasts. They're all alumni. They're treated as alumni now of Ask the CEO. So they have a special category. Right. So that keeps me in front of them. They might not need me now. They might need me forever. And I'm really sorry about that. I forgot to turn the ringer off on my cell phone. That's so right. I hope it doesn't bother <laughs> the audience too badly. No. But yeah, the, the point is, is that once I have a relationship, with the CEOs, and I can I contact them regularly. They might not need me right away. They might not need me ever. But guess what? They know a lot of people. Yes. They might say to their friend, hey, you know what? I was on a show with Greg Demetrio, and he's got this marketing agency. You might want to give him a call. It's happened already. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's a personal brand that's connected to the company. I try not to be the personal brand of Lorraine Gregory Communications, because someday I'm not going to be around there. Right? The company's going to have to live and stand on its own marketing and advertising. But for now, I can actually be a great help to that by doing what I do. Absolutely. And I benefit by learning. When I talk to CEOs, I'm learning all the time. I'm not the be-all and the end-all. I'm not the, the sharpest knife in the, in the drawer. And I pick up pearls, management tips and hints that lead me into a better place as a boss, as an executive, as a CEO, as a chairman, right? I learn every day. And that's that's why I, the Ask a CEO show is my passion. Yes. My job as a CEO of Lorraine Gregory is my job. And it's great to be learning and knowing that you're learning and you're progressing and moving forward. I think that that's one of the things that stimulates all of us to know that we're yeah. we're a bit better than we were last week, put it that way. That, that's one of the questions I always ask on my CEO show is, is what gets you up in the morning? Yeah. What gets you up and going to work in the morning? Because if you don't have that, why, why are you bothering? You know, exactly. you can have a job anywhere, but, you know, if you're going to be in business, be in business. Absolutely. One of the other things that we, we, we briefly touched upon, I think, um, would be quite interesting, particularly for the audience that I have in the software sector, is because 99% of them are using predominantly digital forms of marketing. And that makes sense because of the background and where they come from. And a lot of these software companies grew up with as that digital marketing did. But I think that there's an opportunity there with the older traditional types of marketing. And you've experienced both. So talk to us about that. Well, I tell you what, the digital space is wonderful. I have a stack of envelopes that I'm looking at right now. And where did they come from? Google, Facebook, right? Um, Progressive Insurance, some brand names that you see all over, right? You see them online, you see them on TV. And what are they using? Direct marketing to get to me. Why? Because it works. Yes. They're smarter than I am, right? And if I see that mail keep coming, I know it works. If you remember, you're in the software space, if you remember way, way, way back with AOL, all right, when AOL would send you a CD, and offer you a thousand and three hours. Yes, you would right. get you would get these things like twice a week. Yes. Why did you get them? Because they worked. Mm. Because they, they knew every time they rolled out X, they were going to get Y back. Right? They were very professional in what they did. So that's the thinking you have to have now to say, oh, where's my ROI? Well, AOL was an online company. Well, you would have thought that they would have stayed online to advertise the market. No. They had to drive the people to themselves. Mm. Same thing with the digital space. Digital is wonderful, but that's not the be all and the end all. That's why the term is integrated, Mark. Integrated is digital, 
traditional print, radio, TV, whatever, and also your out of home, your billboards, your kiosks, your branding opportunities of, of facilities. And like in hospitals, and so you can brand a wing in a hospital if you got that kind of pocketbook, right? Mm. All right, and vice versa. So your name is out there. So there's all different types of things that come into play when you talk about marketing. And digital is wonderful. It's a great vehicle. It's helped us do our job I can't, immensely. There's so many different platforms, so many different ways. You got geo targeting, retargeting. You got every different kind of play in the world on the digital space to utilize if you think about your audience first. Where am I going to reach my audience? Where is my audience playing? Where are they consuming data, right? Where are they consuming media, right? Is it, is it streaming? Is it OTT? What is it? Where are they? Are they watching me at home at night? Are they going on their way to school? Are they in the car? Where is my audience? What, is they, what do they look like? How do they consume my information? And that's where the marketing and integration comes because it's not one channel. It can't be one channel. If it's one channel, you might as well save your money and not do it. Mm. And I think a lot of companies seem to be following the same sort of pattern, which is they think website, they think of SEO, they think of Google AdWords, and maybe posting on LinkedIn. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. And they often don't get around to that. But they miss so much. One of the skills that I think... I saw more in the 80s, and there was much more focus on that, was um, professional copywriting, really you know, skilled people in being able to communicate with words. I don't see that as much. I mean, my son does that. He now lives in Spain, and when he asked me, he, he wanted some advice about what are the key skills. I said, you need to be able to communicate. Copywriting is one of the first skills you probably want. And he went and studied that, and you know, I, I uh, introduced him to some really good people in that area. I don't see an abundance of that, and I don't see an abundance of using those people in the software sector. I don't know what it's like in other sectors. They think it can do it themselves. Yeah, everybody thinks they're an author. Yeah. Everybody, right? Um, I'm a bit of an author. I've been published nationally. I have a blog, and, and many people have blogs today. But what, what, the, what is the content? What's the content saying? My, my articles that I write for, for the business newspapers and stuff is business oriented, not always marketing, right? Mm -hmm. The last one I put in was uh, about my view of the $15 minimum wage, totally disconnected from marketing, but connected to me, right? Sure. Copywriting, good, good copywriting is about selling, like you're having a conversation with the person who's reading it. Yes. Right? Yeah. And there are not a lot of good copywriters. And good, good, good copywriters, good marketing copywriters are two uh, hen's teeth. They're yes. hard to find. And, and if he sticks to it and, and builds up his reputation, he'll do super well. Because words will matter. They always matter. They always have mattered. Yes. So many companies that I look at and I think, I, you know, I've been in the software sector for years and years, and I don't understand what they're saying. They, they, they create this sort of strange sub-language, which they use when they're, when they're talking oh, to their colleagues. <laughs> and, and sometimes when they talk to their customers, some of their customers may understand it, but it becomes this strange oh. language that people just don't get it. And, and they won't try. They're not oh. going to work hard to understand it. But they don't know. The, I, was, I, I did a post, I think I told you, was that the biggest problem that the software sector has is not that they don't communicate. It's the illusion that they have that they are communicating. Because if you don't know you've got the problem, you're not going to go and get it fixed. And that's the big problem that they have. Oh, God. Jargon, jargon is, <laughs> is like a, a, a comfortable slipper to some people. They can't get out of it. But you can you can translate jargon into English. Yes, yeah. yes. You wouldn't believe how much jargon we get in this industry. Oh, it, I can't imagine. I can't it's imagine. incredible. <laughs> I see whole sentences of acronyms. You know, so, yeah, English is a second language for you at that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I think that there is there is a really a uh, good opportunity for a lot of software companies that want more of that integrated package and are willing to look outside of what everyone else is doing. 
that's yeah. that's the other thing is you've yeah. got to be be a bit creative and not do what all of your competitors are doing and you know, that's something that you can offer yeah. it's interesting because this, this ask a ceo scenario leads into interesting conversations i i interviewed a global franchise uh marketer not the franchisees so much the franchisors the main sure. companies he's yep. involved with them and we had a conversation he said you know what most of them don't know what the hell they're doing when it comes to marketing they spend a ton of money they generate all kinds of stuff but only the top two percent three percent really know what they're doing so guess what that's a huge lead for me mm. right he's he's connected globally to the franchise world right i need one account and i'm golden right yes. you know uh, you, you're going to find me, find me a software company that we could, we could dabble in or maybe, right? Um, we're actually in, in an acquisition mode. We've done very well with acquisitions. We've done three in the past and we're in, in a position now to do some more uh, in, our, in our industry uh, sure. to bring sure. more skills on board. Uh, the industry is hurting. The smaller shops are hurting. They're, they're, they're doing something that's really disastrous to the industry. They're, they're, they're discounting everything. Mm. Okay. Now, the same thing happens in the printing industry. When, when print started to be less popular, printers started to drop their price. Why? Because they had all this heavy equipment in the back that needed to be fed, mm. right, to keep the margins there. So they kept dropping their price, dropping their price, dropping their price until printing became a commodity. You know, so it was it was knuckleheaded. Print used to be a service business all the way, all the way, all the way. It was service business because you taught the customer what they needed to do in terms of a good printed document. But when they turned it into a commodity, well, look at what you have now. You have four over. You have the, all these online plays, and the issue with that is when you send them their file, you're going to get back whatever your file was. You don't know whether it's good, better, and different. They'll print anything, right? Mm -hmm. So you turned you turned a, a service industry into a commodity industry, and now software and so forth is taking that over. That's going to happen. I mean, everything is disruptive now. You're especially on your side of the street. No, you no. you guys are disrupting so much. Absolutely. You know, I talked to a guy the other day who had a, a Quintonic, I think is the name of his bank. It's an online bank. It's got no buildings. It's got no nothing. It's all online. It's all a software play. Right, and he's disrupting the the business, the the banking business. Why? Because people are going away from the brick and mortar bank to somebody online. Millennials love that stuff, mm. and none of them have checkbooks. So what do they need a checkbook for? They don't need to go to the bank anymore. Take a picture of their check, deposit it, and send a, send an email with the, their funds. So everything is disruptive, and you have to be careful. So we're trying to position ourselves as more holistic. We can sit you down at the table. We want to be your partner when we start talking about marketing campaigns. We don't want to be a vendor. I don't care. I've been a vendor for too long. We don't want to be a vendor. We want to be your partner in the effort. And, and your, your success is our success. And that's the way we approach it. If we don't do, we're not successful for you, please don't, you know, don't hire us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, 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 same thing with the software space. If your software doesn't work, well, it doesn't work and it's got too many workarounds that you have to fool around. It's not worth anything, mm. right? So you have to get that done correctly first before you can go to market and say, hey, listen, look at this weird new shiny object. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, I mean, all of the software entrepreneurs that I speak to, they're all totally convinced. There's a lot of good people in this sector that they've got great software. Having great software is not where it's at anymore. That's just a given. That's just like a doctor saying, I don't kill people with, with my prescriptions. That's it. The bit that where it's really at now is the communication. To sum up, a couple of points of, from your experience to, to talk to my audience about marketing. If you had to give them a couple of tips, what are the things that you've learned over the years, the most important things to, to know or to think about, to focus upon in marketing? It's all about the audience. Who is the audience? What's the need of the audience? They created software to address a need. How deeply did they take a look at that need? How deep? I have a friend of mine who's doing a patient optimization software package now for major hospital systems. And what is it about? It's about 
person A has been sitting in room B for 12 minutes now. Who saw him? When are you going to move him? Move him on. Move him on. Move him on. Get him through the system faster. What faster is less expensive, right? So things like that have an application that means something. I mean, nobody needs bells and whistles anymore. Nobody wants bells and whistles. You could create, like I said, the shiny object, the new shiny object. Oh, I got to have that. No, you don't. And your guys need to communicate why. The why of their, their uh, existence is the most important thing. Can you save me money? Can you get me more business, right? Can you make my life easier, right? It's all about, it's not about your, your features. It's not about the features of the software. It's about the benefits. If I buy your software package or now if I subscribe to your platform, what am I going to be able to do? And how easy is that to do? They need to communicate the back office of the software, if you will. Mm. Software is wonderful. And then you find out it takes you six months to learn it and use it. Well, I don't want that. I'm a CEO. I got no time for my people to take six months to learn anything. Right. So if they have a program that's basically put it up, it'll take you a day, two days, you'll know the thing inside out, and then you could exercise all the features. Right. That's what they need to communicate. But I'm also going to say that some of these software guys, and you could tell me if I'm wrong, most of them are fairly younger. Right. Uh, more ecologically concerned. Sure. Right? So they have an opportunity to speak to the community via their personal likes and dislikes, right? I mean, obviously, you need to take a chance if you're going to pick a side. You don't want to pick a side of a controversy because if you do that, you're alienating half of your audience, right? You found that out in the last election. Those numbers were outrageous. But half of them are still thinking the same way. The other half are still thinking the same way. So where are you going to pick? You can't pick. You need to be quiet about that. But you can say, I'm concerned about the environment. We're a green company. We're doing things to help green environmental companies. We're doing things to promote inclusivity. We're doing things to promote equality. We're doing things to promote social justice. Those are part of their story. And those resonate with huge, huge portions of the community out there, the business community and the, and the individual community. You have to understand that you as a business person, you as an entrepreneur are still an individual and you're not unique. There are a lot of people who think and act the way you do. And those are the people you wanna reach So, because they'll have an understanding of who you are and they'll like you for that. And they'll go further into what you're offering. Hey, I like this, I like the guy, I like the cut of his jib. You know, I like the way he thinks. Mm. You know, communication takes lots of different avenues. And I don't think you should ever hold back. You should be smart about what you're communicating. Your message needs to be consistent, especially if you're talking about a branded message. You know, the same type of the message should go out on all platforms, but it should be slightly different on all platforms because the audience is slightly different. Yeah, so consistency, but be, maybe taking into consideration the platform that you're on. Your message Absolutely. would be different on Facebook than it would be, for instance, on LinkedIn. Exactly. You, although you may be speaking to the same people, I think it's what they're expecting. Facebook tends to be a bit more personal, LinkedIn, a bit more business-like. What is a brand? A brand is a promise of an experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. keep that consistency. Well, I think one of the things that I, I always look for with businesses is is some personality personality of the individuals and then being able to portray that and for the business itself and some consistency. And I think one thing that uh, has come across very well today is you definitely came across with some personality today, Greg, <laughs> and you told a very interesting story. And I think that uh, a lot of people will appreciate that. So I thank you very much for your time oh. today. You're based in Long Island, Lear, New York. Right. Tell us how people can get hold of you. We're in a suburb of New York. We're about 40 miles outside of the city. The local train station is right here. We can be in the city in less than a half an hour. Uh, so we walk on both sides of the river, I like to say. You can reach us at two different places, LorraineGregory.com, which is the corporate identity, or you can reach us at GregsCornerOffice.com. Greg's Corner Office is the home of the Ask a CEO 
interview series. It's available on YouTube as a video and on all the streaming services at Ask a CEO. Uh, our phone number, if you need us, is 631-694-1500. And I would advise you all to go look at our website because it's brand new. We're very proud of it. We just launched it last week, and we really tried to show off what we can do. So give, it, give yourself a treat and check it out. The most effective pitch I think I've had from anyone when I've given that opportunity. I didn't need to ask you twice, did I, Greg? <laughs> no, no, sir. <laughs> That's being a tough New Yorker. Give them an inch. You're going to dive in there, aren't you? <laughs> you didn't tell me I only had 12 seconds. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you're right. Yeah, take it. Go for it. That's, that's fine. Any, and I'm no, I, I don't have any problem with that at all. I think it's great. Really good. So thank you very much for that. Oh, Mark, I got to tell you, what a great conversation. We've been on here for quite a while. I know. It was, I uh, how I... much are you going to have to cut and leave on the cutting room floor? <laughs> None of it. We're going to have all 40 minutes. 40 minutes we did, and we were talking wow. before that. So that's good. Wow. That's, that's really right. good. I just, I just started you and you way you went. All right, as soon as the link goes up, make sure I get it, because I'm going to post it all over the place. That's brilliant. Great Mark, talking to you, Greg. Thank you. Greg. So thank you thank that was the Boss It Podcast. If you like what you hear, then spread it around. And if you didn't, come and tell me, and I'll do something about it. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Thank Please you, Greg. Care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.